Uh, I want to thank Rolf and the other organizers of the meeting for what I'm sure is going to be a fantastic day. I also uh, really want to thank them for including the SOEs as part of this conversation uh, and, and really bringing us into the picture because I think uh, we have a lot of shared uh, interests that we can really be beneficial. So I was putting this talk together and I, this is the title that I gave Rolf. And as I was putting it together, I realized it's sort of a misleading title. Um, the better title is probably with a question mark, Impact of Lecture SOEs on STEM Teaching and Research. And so I'll talk a little bit today about how we're trying to approach this question and some of the things we've learned so far. Before I get into that, what in the world is an LSOE? It stands for Lecture with Security of Employment. There is also LPSOE, Lecture with Potential Security of Employment. It just rolls off the tongue. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, this is great at meetings when we have to explain this to people. Um, it's a tenure track position. It's been on the books. It's uh, for UC wide. It's UC wide. It's been on the books for decades. It's been, people have been in this position for decades. But there's been a drastic shift over the last five or 10 years in terms of what is expected of these individuals. Um, it is to me, it's supposed to mirror the traditional research track. So we go up for our promotions at the same rate. We get merits at the same rate. Um, the LPSOE is the non-tenured, same as the assistant professor. SOE is associate professor, and then there's senior lecturer, which is the full professor. Um, we really go by these uh, teaching professors now, many of us at different campuses. So I'm an associate teaching professor. And then there are less questions about what in the world is it that you are. Uh, what are the expectations for promotion? Uh, this is another one that, question mark. Um, it's, it's very different campus to campus. It's very different department to department on a given campus. Uh, but the general idea is that we are guided or we are judged or evaluated, not judged. Uh, we're evaluated on the same three branches as traditional research faculty, teaching, professional development, and service. Uh, but obviously, the, the proportions are different. Um, high quality teaching, uh, the biggest part, professional development, which could be things like obtaining external funding, it could be publishing in education literature, outreach to K through 12, uh, things of that nature, and then service as well. And so as I mentioned, this has been something that's been changing quite a bit over the last few years. And so we wanted to make sure that we were part of this conversation in terms of what is expected. And so something we did, I along with uh, one of my collaborators, Pavan Kadandale, who's another SOE, uh, we put together this grant from UCOP, the UC Research Opportunity Fund, a few years ago. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to create a network of SOEs uh, across the system. And so we wanted to define the position and generate collaborative projects as well. And so we held five meetings between spring 2014 and 2016. And uh, there were a variety of things that happened. We had participation from almost all of the UC campuses. It was a great group of people. Uh, originally, it was sort of very self-serving that we knew we'd be going up for tenure. We needed to meet people to ask for letters and things of that nature. Um, we, there's another component of this is that each campus that participated, so originally it was Irvine, San Diego, Merced, and Santa Barbara. Each campus agreed to bring an, a lecturer over so they could give a seminar and things like that so we could sort of uh, broaden our, our audience. But it ended up ev evolving much more into a STEM education group. So we invited other STEM faculty that were interested in teaching. Uh, we invited education re researchers. And so we, we, we put a, a lot of great things together. And so a natural question that came out of this is, well, how are LSOEs impacting the system? And so you can imagine we are teaching-focused faculty. Is it possible that we're improving the overall quality of education? I'm sure you know over the last decade, there have been a number of national reports about the need to improve undergraduate STEM education. Uh, this is the 2012 PCAST report, which said we need a million more STEM graduates. And one of the ways we're going to get them is by retaining the ones we already have. So this report said that 60% of undergraduates entering as STEM majors do not graduate as STEM majors within six years. And so if we were able to keep just a fraction of these people, uh, we'd be able to reach this million uh, additional graduates. And so well, how do we do that? You can look through the literature, and you can get different examples of, of ways that this has happened. So this came out in Science in 2011. And this group showed that by using active learning and increased structure in large lecture courses, you can increase performance, especially for at-risk students. So active learning, more interaction in the classroom, more interaction with peers, with faculty, high structure classes, really making sure that students are responsible for their learning. 
So having assignments on a, a daily basis, multiple exams over the quarter, things of that nature. And again, you can look through the literature, you can find a number of examples of these, and that's fantastic, but it's a very small fraction of instructors who are actually doing this. It's just the, the random individuals who happen to be dissatisfied with the way they're teaching, they decide to do something new, but it is absolutely not happening on a broad scale. And so how is it that we can uh, possibly adopt these on a wider scale? There are a few different methods people use. Uh, for example, creating campus teaching and learning centers. I believe most of our campuses have those. Uh, faculty learning communities. Going after the next generation of faculty, our graduate students. And embedding teaching faculty in departments, which happens to be what the LSOEs are. And so what we did a, a year ago, and this actually came out of this series of meetings we held, we put together an NSF IUS grant, Improving Undergraduate STEM Education. And the goal was to assess the SOE position. So this is a grant between three campuses, Irvine, San Diego, and Davis. And our goal was, is to assess the LSOE uh, position in a data-driven manner. And sort of the long-term long view, view is, can this be a model that other institutions use to bring about change? Uh, we were told officially that we got the grant about a week ago, so I have no actual data to tell you <laughs> about, but I'll tell you about what we, oh, thank you. Um, now we have to actually do something. <laughs> so our research questions are, do SOEs influence conversations about teaching in their department? Do they impact teaching practices of the traditional research faculty? What effect do they have on departmental productivity? And are the expectations between the stakeholders, the deans and the chairs that are hiring these positions, similar to the, the perspective of the actual LSOE faculty? So again, uh, questions, no data, but hopefully in a year or two we'll have a story to tell uh, about what we're doing and in a data-driven manner. So before I go to the second part, are there any just general questions about the position, about the grant, things of that nature? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Manny Aries, UC Santa Cruz. I was curious what you meant by departmental productivity. Departmental productivity. So what we meant, we hear, I mean, so depending on the department, depending on the campus, hiring of LSOEs is, is there are very different rates at which that happens. And one of the concerns is that in some cases, it's sort of we have an FTE, we either go traditional research or SOE. And a concern there is, well, if we do that, are we losing out on publications? Are we losing out on grant funding? And so we want to get those metrics and see departments that have SOEs versus not, or sort of longitudinally, how those numbers change. Hi, Katie Clark. Um, I'm wondering how many departments will hire LSOEs as opposed to visiting or adjunct positions? Uh, so that's an excellent question. So we have visiting and adjuncts. We also have the Unit 18 lecturer. And again, it depends a little bit on the department, departmental climate. Um, and it's, it's very much a case-by-case -case basis. If you look throughout the UC system, there are some campuses that have nearly zero SOEs on campus. There are some that have, had, that have a ton. Um, Irvine, I know, has expanded greatly just in the last few years. Like, I was the first one hired in biology, and since then we've had a number, I think, eight more in the last five years, something like that. So it really depends on the climate. It really depends on the chair and what their beliefs are about the position. Um, but we are trying to show that we're bringing a lot to the table, much more than maybe a Unit 18 lecture. All right, um, and I'd be happy to answer questions throughout the day. And so the first part is sort of, well, what are we doing system-wide? Another way you can look at impact in t is in terms of individuals. What is each person doing? And when we look at this, we want to think beyond the institution. That if you think of traditional research faculty, they're not judged based just on what they're doing on their campus. They're doing, judged based on what they're doing nationwide, internationally. And so one way you can look at our contribution nationally or internationally is education publications. So there are a number of education publications coming out from SOEs. For example, this one looking at exam analysis and intro bio. This one looking at what students pay attention to in terms of uh, learning about translation. This one looking at assessment of a primary literature module. Uh, a lot of examples looking at laboratory exercises that we create and assessing what they're doing with our students. And this one looking at problem solving 
in the context of stoichiometry. And as I said, if you line up all the, the SOEs, you can see a number of them are participating in education research. And so I want to share just one example of a project that came out of UC Irvine uh, where we were looking at prerequisites. This came out in PLOS One earlier this year. And what we're looking at is this typical way that STEM curricula are built, that students take Bio One, they got to pass Bio One in order to take Bio Two, they have to pass Bio Two in order to take Bio Three. We also have this, if you really think about it, bizarre case of co-requisites where being in Bio One means you're able to be in Bio Two. Um, and this is ubiquitous for STEM curricula, and really most curricula in higher education. But why in the world do we have that? And so you can think about that question on a few levels, sort of historically. If anyone knows the answer, please tell me, because I haven't been able to find it. Um, but the other question is in terms of uh, functionality. And so what I want you to do, take maybe 30 seconds, talk to your neighbors. Why does your campus or why does your program have prerequisites? All right, I hate to stop all the great conversations that are happening, but can we get a, f a few volunteers? What is one reason your campus has prerequisites? Yeah. Hi, Morse Pedro, right here. In fact, just one floor up. So, had a short trip. So, our campus historically has had a uh, first quarter chemistry requirement for our intro cell and molecular course for life sciences majors, which is here called Bio 5A. And it's historical because some 20 years ago, as our campus was experiencing growth, we just wanted a way to stem the tide of all those people that wanted to come into intro bio okay. so that we didn't have to handle so many of them. And here's the problem is at the time, the pass rates in the introductory chemistry were something like 75, 80 percent. Well, the chemistrists, have, they, they've gotten better and <laughs> they have a a pre-chem course called Chem 1W where they do problem-based learning and now their pass rate is 95%. And so it, has, it doesn't do that at all. It just delays them by one quarter. And in fact, their intro chemistry doesn't cover anything that, that we need. Tomorrow I'm going to be, on, on Monday I'm talking about pH. They don't get to pH till the second quarter of chemistry where they do solution chemistry. So all they get is atoms and bonding in three weeks of units. So it doesn't serve us any purpose except I, I to slow them down. I appreciate the honesty. I like that. I like that. Uh, others? Yeah. I'd just like to comment that this 300 student class in circadian biology that I talked about is cross listed between molecular biology and psychology, and the only thing that we require is the equivalent of Bio 1. Uh, they, they have to understand that a gene codes for information that's transcribed and translated uh, because we do talk about circadian gene expression, but everything else we try to give them, which is why we need these little tutorials. Uh, Katie Clark, and I'll say that my undergrad uh, liberal arts school I went to, it was historic. You took math to take chemistry, to take physics, to take biology, because that's the way it had been done. Okay. Uh, I don't know what to do with this. You're supposed to give me these answers that are plausible for why we're doing this. I'll give you the plausible answers that we hear. Um, we are teaching students content and skills needed for future success. Students need maturation time. We hear, I have this class, it's for upper division students, couldn't possibly be taken by a lower division. And as someone mentioned, logistics are part of this. So for example, at UC Irvine, our lower division biology core, we offer once per academic year. So our version of Bio 1 in the fall, if we have 1,000 students there, we know how many seats we need to offer for Bio 2. Um, when we were thinking about this prerequisite idea, we wanted to get the perspective of the students. And so we conducted some semi-structured interviews with students about prerequisites. And we pulled out a number of positive things that they felt were going on. So giving them background knowledge, important for future success. Um, they saw how it contributes to interest to subject material. So students would say, I really didn't want to take this course, but I found out I actually enjoyed that topic. And they noted that behaviors improve as well. So things like study skills and not just content is being learned. 
but they highlighted a number of negatives as well. So scheduling issues. If everyone has to take this prerequisite, some students aren't going to be able to. It's going to delay their graduation. Um, if they really want to take this course, but they have to take three prerequisites to get there, again, we're delaying time to graduation. And with the cost of education now, it's, it's even more of an issue. They also are not stupid. They realize that a lot of faculty aren't using them as they probably should be. So they hear all this stuff in Bio 1. They hear the exact same stuff in Bio 2. So why did they bother hearing it in Bio 1? And so in light of these negative consequences that I think as faculty we often don't really think about, um, it's important that we can show that these benefits are actually happening. And so how do we do that? So here's another question that I want uh, you to discuss with your neighbors. Uh, possibly your campus does assess prereqs, and maybe it doesn't. And if it doesn't, how do you think uh, you would go about doing that? So I know that's a huge question, but you have 30 seconds to solve the problem. All right, I have to cut you off again. Just with a, with a show of hands, how many of you at your campus, in some form or another, do you assess prerequisites? One, two, three and a half? Uh, that's about what I expected. Um, which, good for you, three and a half. Uh, the way, if you look at the literature, it's traditionally done. One thing you can do is you can say, OK, we have this course, maybe bio two. Let's look at the students who did and did not take Bio 1. How are they doing on exams or, or the course overall? This is assuming that we have a recommended prereq. If everyone had to take Bio 1, you're not going to have those two groups to look at. Another thing people do is they look at correlations. If you got an A in Bio 1, do you get an A in Bio 2? Uh, the issue there, though, is not only is this assuming there's a lot of overlap in terms of content, it assumes there's a lot of overlap in terms of assessment. So what if Bio 1 is all multiple choice memorization? Bio 2 is all short answer data analysis. I don't know if we necessarily expect an A in one to equal an A in the other. If you look through the literature and ask the question, is prerequisite completion beneficial? It very much depends. So depending on the study you look at. And when we were thinking about this problem, we thought, well, it depends, one, because situations are unique. Courses are unique. Students are unique. Campuses are unique. But the other reason we thought it, 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 we get these variable results is because the way that prereqs are assessed are too global that you're looking, what is the impact on this entire course grade of this prerequisite? And, and that might not be something that can be teased out. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look in more sort of fine green detail. And we created what we called familiarity. And what familiarity is, is the amount of concept overlap for a given exam question. So rather than looking at exams overall or course grade overall, we looked at an individual exam and said, how much overlap is there from the prior course? Uh, we looked at this in a few different contexts. The one I'm going to bring up first is a genetics course, which acts as a prereq for a molecular biology course. And we created three levels of familiarity. Very familiar means that if we look at this molecular biology exam question, the student should already be able to answer it based on what they learned in genetics. That's very familiar to them. Familiar means this molecular biology exam question covers a topic that was discussed in genetics, but not to a great deal uh, uh, amount. And not familiar means this molecular biology exam question covers a concept that was not discussed at all in the genetics prerequisite. And so our hypothesis was, if this prerequisite is a sort of priming future learning, we would expect to see student performance should be highest on very familiar, and then familiar exam questions, and then not familiar exam questions. The way we did this analysis, uh, first we had to figure out, well, how do you dictate the familiarity of a question? And if you look at the literature, uh, perceptions even of what's happening in a given classroom can be very different from the student perspective and the faculty perspective. So there's no one perfect way to do it. And so we did it in three different ways. One, we took lecture slides from that prerequisite. And we had an uh, independent team of researchers look at the molecular biology exam questions in the context of these lecture slides. 
We also had a genetics instructor who kindly looked at some of our molecular biology exam questions and rated his familiarity based on what he teaches. And we took students who had just completed the genetics prereq but had not yet enrolled in that molecular biology course and got their perspective as well. What we then do, so for example, let's say we had 10 molecular biology exam questions. We would use one of those three methods to dictate familiarity, and we would bin those questions based on familiarity. So all the very familiar questions, familiar and not familiar. And we then looked at the average exam performance in each category. And if our hypothesis is correct, we should end up seeing something like this. So what did we see? Does increased familiarity lead to increased performance? Um, so here is where we designate familiarity by our genetics lecture slides, genetics instructor, and uh, genetics students. And what we see is in some cases, students are doing better on the very familiar questions. But in no cases is there a significant difference between the familiar and not familiar. So as far as our initial hypothesis, it looks like the second half of that may not be true. Now, one issue with this analysis is that questions are different. Questions are different in a number of ways, um, one of them being this familiarity term, but another being what is expected of the students. So it's very different if it, they're being asked to uh, recite a name of a protein versus analyze a, a graph, for example. And so we can control for that using Bloom's taxonomy. So Bloom's taxonomy uh, categorizes the types of thought required to solve a given problem. So you have Bloom's level one and two, which are more memorization based. Uh, Bloom's four, analysis, so that would be our graph example. Bloom's five, synthesis, maybe creating an experiment. Uh, evaluation, Bloom six, uh, critiquing an experiment, for example. And so we bloomed all of our exam questions in addition to the uh, noting their familiarity. And we ran them through a multiple linear regression model. Don't worry if this doesn't make sense to you. Um, some of the key points, students in this case did significantly better on very familiar questions compared to familiar, but there was no difference between the familiar and not familiar, even when controlling for blooms. What we did notice in this particular case, higher blooms level, that's what influenced performance, which not necessarily so surprising. We looked at this uh, in a few different cases as well so far, a human physiology anatomy pairing, a microbiology lecture and lab pairing, and again, in all cases, we saw no difference between that familiar and not familiar performance. So, what do we learn from this? Um, one, it's important to assess prereqs. We conducted these student interviews, and honestly, I didn't really think about the impact on their scheduling, and maybe I'm just not a compassionate person, but I, I'd like to think that, that I am. Um, but all of these negative, uh, negative things that are associated with prereqs, that, that these are really weighing on our students. And if we're going to make them go through that, it's important that we can show value to our students. Um, this assessment act, it allowed us to communicate more with other faculty. So I teach the molecular biology course. I honestly had no idea what was happening in genetics besides genetics. Um, and so what I found looking through lecture slides and things like that, that I, I would repeat a lot of stuff they already did. And so now that I know this, I change how I teach my molecular biology course. I say, I know you already learned X, so we're going to build off of that now. If you need to go back, here's the textbook reading, here's the, the old lecture slides, you can learn it that way. And really holding students responsible for keeping that information with them, which is something we don't really do at all. It also brings up this question of breadth versus depth. Uh, often we hear from faculty, especially in the quarter system, we just have so much to cover. We have to cover everything, we only have 10 weeks. And the reason they want to cover everything is because we're, by, by talking about this now, it's going to prime this future learning. And what we would claim based on our results so far is that that would be treated sort of as a familiar topic. But if there's no difference between the familiar and the not familiar, it might be in the, in the student's interest to eliminate the number of topics you talk about in a given quarter and increasing the, uh, the amount and emphases on those few topics that you feel are really important. Uh, this is also something that we're hoping to expand, that we're doing it with other classes at UCI. Uh, we're talking to people at Santa Barbara as well as UCLA and some other non-UC institutions as well um, to increase that. So if this is something that you think your campus or program might be interested in, please talk to us uh, and we'd be happy to, to collaborate on that. Uh, before I take questions, I want to thank uh, Justin and Pavan, who are also SOEs, and they were co-authors on this prerequisite work along with a number of very talented undergraduates that we worked with, uh, some of them here. I also want to thank Michael Denon, who is our 
Dean of the Division of Undergrad Education. Does that sound right, guys? Sarah? And Sarah, who is our Associate Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning. I got that one right, right? Um, and they were instrumental in uh, getting us that NSF IUS grant, and so I want to thank them as well. Before I take questions, I, I want to plug something. Uh, UC Irvine is hosting a STEM education meeting. So Susan mentioned before a boot camp for how to conduct education research as well as how to implement evidence-based teaching practices. We've got it. It's happening. Um, January 14th and 15th of next year, it is called Sabre West. If you're not familiar, Sabre is the Society for the Advancement of Biology Education Research. Uh, every year there's an annual meeting in Minnesota with over 300 attendees. This is the first regional meeting. It's a two-day meeting, and our goal is to bring together STEM educators and education researchers, especially fostering collaborations between two- and four-year institutions. This is something I think we uh, very much ignore, despite the fact that a huge number of our students are coming from the community college system. And also, as I mentioned, we're going to have workshops both on how to do education research and implement evidence-based teaching practices. We have a great list of speakers, um, both uh, STEM educators as well as education researchers from all over the country. If you have questions, here's the website, or just talk to me and I can send you the information. And uh, hopefully you're interested because I'd, I'd love to send it so you can send it out to all your faculty. Um, and with that, if we have time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Uh, John Griga, uh, UC Berkeley. I was just wondering uh, if the pattern that you're seeing could be attributed to the fact that we're teaching students or students are memorizing facts and then if something becomes more unfamiliar, they, can't, they don't have the concepts to actually uh, make the leap and solve uh, problems that are a little, uh, little more distant. Right, so there are, there are a number of potential explanations for why it is that we're not seeing these gains in the familiar questions. And I think that goes back to us and, and what we're doing both in the prerequisite course as well as the, in the later linked course. That if, uh, in this particular case, we're just looking at concepts, but if we want to think about it in terms of skills, Skills are absolutely something we could be teaching in the prereqs. And if that's something we really demand in that later course, that's something we should be discussing with the instructors the prerequisite course that not only talk about DNA replication, but talk about maybe experimental design for how they discovered some of these factors. Um, but you're right, that's absolutely one of the possible reasons why we see that. Yeah. One of the other issues about prerequisites is that very often those prerequisite courses are taught by many different faculty who mm -hmm. are not all teaching the same set of stuff. And this goes back to your depth versus breadth question, which is a comment. Uh, almost all faculty seem to feel, oh, I have to cover all this stuff. But they don't know how to pace themselves to cover all that stuff, which means that you get to the second course in the series, and, and half of the students, because of whoever their professor was, didn't get the last three chapters you know, of what was on that syllabus. Absolutely. And so I think that that's another critical thing, is that if there are going to be prerequisites, there needs to be some coordination among uh, lecture sections on what is it that's going to be covered, and, and, a, and essentially a, a, an agreement. We, we will, in fact, uh, cover these essential things at the expense of covering everything. You're absolutely right. And in terms of, I mean, there are a number of logistics for why prex may not be doing what the, they should be doing. And uh, we, so we've, in our department, we had a little experience sort of bringing together the different instructors that teach different sections and trying to get on the same page. I don't want to say disaster, but it was not as positive <laughs> as maybe it could have been. Um, but it, you're right, and there needs to be something, sir, you need buy-in from all levels. You need the higher-ups, the chairs, and whoever's planning the, the curriculum to really say, this is something that we're going to make a priority. You need to have buy-in from the people teaching the courses in terms of what is my incentive for changing. I've been doing this for 20 years. It's been working great. Why are you going to make me go through all this work to do that? And it's true that there needs to be an incentive on that level, too, that they need to feel, not that they're being told to do this, but here's the reason why I want to do this. Um, but it does require sort of a, a bottom to top end and top to bottom change. Super King, UPI. I was wondering if you looked at the performance of students who um, take classes. It's not on. Okay. 
I was I'm wondering if you took a look at the students that are taking classes in the summer when prerequisites are not checked and they can take these multiple classes so, together. Right, at UCI in the summer, prereqs are not even checked. We have looked at a couple cases where, where actually in this particular molecular biology genetics case where students who were taking the molecular biology course without the genetics and they did just as well as the people who, who took genetics. Uh, so uh, one thing I think we should discuss and think about is that prereqs have a, a very negative impact, particularly in regards to our goal of increasing retention, particularly with first generation students. You think about students who don't really know what college is, and they get in their freshman year, they, they think they're going to study biology, they were maybe interested in it, and what they do is calculus and chemistry, and mm -hmm. they don't get any biology at all until their second year. In that critical window of time, they may, some of them, probably many of them, may already starting, be starting to get kind of turned off to science because, you know, their calculus, maybe it's not their thing, and chemistry, you know, what, what's the relevance there? Yeah. And um, I, I bring this up because, and I hope we can hit this more at the panel discussion a bit. Um, we, I think we, all UCs kind of do it the same way. I think that's largely true that the second year is when they get biology. I think that's true across all the campuses. At Irvine, they actually the, get it their first year, but a lot of campuses, you're right, yeah. in the second year. And, and it's sort of all the freshmen take calculus and chemistry and so forth. Yeah. And, and so one of the things we can do as a faculty learning community is see if we can consider redesigning that as a group, because it's much harder for one campus to do that, but maybe by collaborating we can actually get something right. changed. And really getting that conversation between the departments going, that getting the biology and the chemistry departments together, and really as a, a team effort, creating sort of a, a synthesized version of a, a lot of the courses they're seeing. And that'll really show the relevance between the chemistry that a lot of times the students don't see. Yeah. Um, Ella Tour, um, UCSD. Uh, I was wondering if you considered looking at the necessity of prerequisites of lower division biology, such as Bio 1, for example, or Build 1 mm -hmm. uh, in, at UCSD, to the next level, such as genetics and molecular biology, because I can imagine that there can be quite a big connection. Just anecdotally, we have uh, we had a lab uh, at UCSD, m m microbiology lab, that actually did not have any prerequisites, and so uh, the, the instructors were getting uh, students from uh, uh, pharmacological sciences who had literally no biology background at all. And that was a very painful experience for, for the instructors. Sure. Um, so f for example, genetics and molecular biology, those, that's a second year course pairing. The other two I mentioned were upper division courses. We don't really see a difference between that, but our sample size is very small. We would love to look at build one and build two or your molecular or microbiology lecture or, or so on. Um, but that would be an interesting question. Lala Gonzalez from UCSB. Uh, I was, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you ever uh, consider looking at a uh, comparison between exams of classes, right? So uh, the exam for bio, uh, for intro bio versus the exam of genetics, for instance, uh, thinking that the uh, emphasis that a, a, a class it's, is given sometimes, you know, it's it's uh, reflected by the importance of the questions in the exam, right? So is there <coughs> a, a way of comparing these two? Uh, right, so I mean, word? yeah, so we haven't done that yet. And what you could do is you could bloom the exams at different levels. So if you bloom the exams in a prereq course, that where, let's say, the, the later course has higher blooms. Let's say we have a version of the prereq that also has higher blooms, a version of the prereq that has lower blooms. Um, that's something that we could absolutely do. Yeah. Can you uh, Ira Clark, UCLA, is it working? Yeah? Yep. OK. Um, so your suggestion about changing how we teach the, uh, the prereq courses um, is an excellent one, but it doesn't necessarily work for students who are transferring from two-year colleges to a four-year. I wonder if you've thought at all about changing the way we teach the upper-level courses so to I think, accommodate for that as well. Yeah, I think changing, it's, it's not something that, hey, the prereq's screwing up and why don't you do a good job like us teaching later courses. There's, there's the communication issues on both sides. And so not only does there need to be communication within a campus, but if we're claiming that these transfer students can come in with their version of Bio 1, we should be talking to those community college instructors as well. And, and at least at UCI, we have a couple community college campuses that uh, give us most of our transfer students. And we have actually sat down 
to make sure that we're sort of on the same page, that our bio one at UCI is similar to their bio one. Um, but I think it's, it's, in, it's our responsibility really to have those discussions as opposed to, well, DNA replication covered, good enough. Um, yeah, uh, Sasha Sher, UCSC. Um, when you were looking at your sample, have you tried dividing it into the students who did really well in the prereq versus the ones that didn't? Just trying to find a con good control. Yeah, so what we did was, well, so in this case, remember, all of our students have taken the prereq, but what we did do is we took, we binned them into thirds, so the top third, middle third, and lower third and see whether or not performance on the very familiar, familiar, and not familiar questions then changes, and the results are the same for the high performing and the low performing and the middle performing. All right, thank you.